Over the past several months, we've talked a lot about LDL cholesterol and how LDL cholesterol levels have a low predictive value for indicating your risk for a future cardiovascular related event. But what about glucose? It turns out that there's ample research to show that elevated post-meal glucose increases your odds in a linear fashion for having a poor for having poor cardiovascular outcomes and also increasing your risk for all-cause mortality. One of the narrative reviews we're gonna talk about today to really drill this home so that you have this information accessible at your fingertips should your primary healthcare practitioner be overly concerned about your total cholesterol levels or LDL cholesterol levels. The title of this narrative review that was published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology is Dietary Strategies for Improving Postprandial Glucose, Lipids, Inflammation, and Cardiovascular Health by James O'Keefe, who has published a lot of really great research, in my opinion, about factors that affect cardiovascular health. And needless to say, heart disease and strokes collectively comprise more than 630,000 deaths here in the U.S. every year, which is the leading cause of premature mortality here in the U.S. and throughout the world. We know that strokes and heart disease are also the leading cause of disability throughout here in the U.S. and throughout the world. So we should care about this. And it turns out that there is low predictive value for LDL cholesterol as it is linked to uh, risk for heart disease and all-cause mortality, which we're going to talk about uh, after we talk about glucose. A recently published study titled J-Shaped Association Between LDL Cholesterol and Cardiovascular Events, a Longitudinal Primary Prevention Cohort of Over 2.4 Million People. We're going to talk about that shortly, but first, let's get into the relationship between increased post-meal glucose and risk for having a cardiovascular event. Recent studies indicate that about one third of American adults and two thirds of coronary artery disease patients have abnormal glucose levels. They go on to talk about how a significant proportion of these individuals will have fasting glucose levels less than 125 milligrams per deciliter, indicating that they have normal glycemia, but after receiving a meal or a, a glucose challenge test, their blood levels would exceed 140 milligrams per deciliter, which would characterize them as pre-diabetic, indicating that they would be at risk for future diabetes and so forth. And it turns out that there is a continuous and linear relationship between glucose levels after a glucose challenge and risk for coronary artery disease. The investigators say at only 80 milligrams per deciliter, the cardiovascular disease risk of a postprandial or post-challenge glycemia begins to increase, and by 140 milligrams per deciliter, this is a point at which you are characterized as having pre-diabetes, the risk for cardiovascular disease increases by some 58%. Now, as you can see here from figure one of this paper, it turns out that hyperglycemia, again, having a post-meal glucose level greater than 140 milligrams per deciliter, that leads to restriction of your coronary arteries. And as we talked about with Dr. Phil Ovedia and other people over the past several years, including Peter Artia and many others, the coronary arteries are the arteries that feed your heart and they're they are very small. And when they get very constricted or occluded from calcification, from plaque and beyond, that can restrict the blood flow to the heart and that can lead to events like having a heart attack or uh, worse, sudden cardiac death. And so as you can see here, there's a linear relationship with your elevated post-meal glucose levels and the degree of constriction of these very small coronary arteries that again, increase your risk of having an event. And so figure one really tells the story and we don't see this so much as a linear relationship with LDL cholesterol levels. So I'm not saying that LDL is always unimportant and we shouldn't consider that, but I am saying because 94% of American adults have some degree of insulin resistance and glucose imbalance. So we probably should be prioritizing balancing blood sugar, especially in the post-meal window. We'll, we'll talk later about ways that you can do that with walking after meals, uh, adequate sleep-wake cycles, uh, high protein, less processed foods, and beyond. So we're gonna continue to dive into the importance of blood sugar levels and talk about the J-shape association with LDL cholesterol levels and risk of death from heart disease as well as all-cause mortality, but first, I hope you're enjoying this content. If you are, please hit that like button. Let me know what you think of this in the comment section below. And I will link these two studies in the description below as well. And also, since we're talking about metabolic health, a tool that might be able to help you, especially if you're prone to craving junk food in the evening. I know sometimes at the end of a stressful day, you might benefit from trying the novel Berbering Fasting Accelerator by Myoscience. Two to three capsules before your last meal may help you curb those pesky evening food cravings and also help support metabolic health. It's been long recognized that Berbering actually increases 
your levels of ketones and ketones help with appetite control and curbing cravings. But don't just believe me, you can see the 300 plus reviews over at myoscience.com from people just like you who are benefiting from the novel Berberin Fasting Accelerator by Myoscience. You can use the coupon code podcast at checkout over at myoscience.com. So going back to this idea that hyperglycemia can constrict your coronary arteries and lead to changes within the vessels and increasing your risk of having an event. I think this is really important to acknowledge and recognize. So it's probably the combination of increased glucose levels and hyperinsulinemia that can exacerbate or worsen cardiovascular related uh, outcomes and events. And I think what's even more important is we have multiple studies now showing that higher hemoglobin A1C, higher fasting glucose, uh, can lead to accelerated aging of the blood vessels, as well as our uh, determinants of atherosclerosis progression over time. And so I think that's really, really interesting. There's a lot of relationships here and studies showing insulin resistance is correlated with coronary artery plaque uh, and elevated levels of hemoglobin A1C and glucose are linked with coronary artery disease and poor outcomes. But one of them that I thought was particularly interesting that was published, at, this was in 2004 actually. So, so this has been long known. Uh, the title of this one is Glucose Metabolism and Coronary Heart Disease in Patients with Normal Glucose Tolerance. And there's all sorts of uh, Kaplan-Meier curves in these various studies showing survivability over time. And the higher your post-meal glucose levels and higher your fasting glucose levels are, they are linked with poor survivability over time, increasing the likelihood that you may suffer from a cardiovascular related event. But it turns out there's not that same statistical association with LDL cholesterol levels. In fact, LDL cholesterol has a low predictive value for developing a future cardiovascular event, as we had hinted about talking about this paper, and we're going to dive into it now, published in the Journal of, of Advanced Research, a cohort of over 2.4 million people were tracked for, on average, nine years. The title of this is The J-Shaped Association Between LDL Cholesterol and Cardiovascular Events, a Longitudinal Primary Prevention Cohort of Over 2.4 Million People Nationwide in South Korea. And what you see here in uh, these figures is the J-shaped association, looking at, at risk of my, myocardial infarction and stroke. And you do not see a linear association with increasing LDL cholesterol levels and risk of having a heart attack or stroke. In fact, it is a J-shaped association, as the title of the study indicates, meaning that if you have levels of LDL cholesterol less than 100 milligrams per deciliter, your risk is actually higher than if you have levels of say 105 or 115 milligrams per deciliter of your LDL cholesterol. Again, the current guidelines, according to the American Heart Association and also Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, is your LDL cholesterol level should be less than 115 milligrams per deciliter. Most doctors and most labs now will highlight that your LDL cholesterol is out of range and they'll put bold or an H for high when your LDL is over 100 milligrams per deciliter. Now, again, I think that's a little interesting because if you look at the study, what the investigators found here, tracking 2.4 million people for the better part of nine years, is the risk of stroke and having a heart attack is actually higher when your LDL cholesterol is lower than 100 milligrams per deciliter. Now, they did adjust for all sorts of different factors, but they essentially highlight here that LDL cholesterol levels have a low predictive value for indicating risk of having a heart attack or stroke uh, when they are less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. And the risk doesn't start to increase uh, until levels are about 159 milligrams per deciliter. So I think it's important to consider things in context. And they do talk about how statins or some of the, the class of medications that are now being used to lower LDL cholesterol have off-target pleiotropic effects that are anti-inflammatory. And there is a, an association with high LDL cholesterol and high C-reactive protein and events. But when you adjust for those different factors, it appears that LDL cholesterol doesn't have this strong independent linear association with increasing cardiovascular disease risk. I'm not, again, saying that you uh, should ignore your high LDL cholesterol. You should consider this in context, as we've talked about in other videos, with your HDL, with your waist circumference, with your C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, lipoprotein little a, LP little a, all these different factors come in uh, to the mix. But as we started off this video, we should really be focusing on glucose because you are eating a thousand meals per year, right? And if those meals are chronically increasing your post-meal glucose, the 
net effect of that could be continual restriction of your coronary arteries, and that could lead to an event or a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, or a stroke, or worse, a blood clot possibly. So I think it's important because we all have tools to assess our glucose. You can go down to Walgreens or Rite Aid and get a glucometer and check your post-meal glucose. Ideally, in the post-meal window, roughly 45 to 60 minutes after you eat, your your glucose should be under 140 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, upon waking first thing in the morning, it should be close, close to 80 as possible. If it's creeping up to 95 or 100, whatever, you need to do some work, my friends. And again, one of the most powerful tools there's natural products like we talked about, myo-inositol, we talked about berberine uh, at length on these in these different videos. Walking after you eat is arguably the best way to lower your post-meal glucose. It turns out that eating is stressful. Eating actually is a stress that disrupts your body's homeostasis. And one way to mitigate that homeostatic stress of eating is to just move your muscles and go for a little bit of a walk. And that might help with your digestion. Uh, uh, one study that I like to cite often is a 15 minute walk three times a day is better than one 45 minute walk uh, in a sort of an exercise format. So these exercise snacks are better than just having one big bolus movement throughout the day. So that's the conclusion here is we have strong linear associations with increasing glucose level and glucose levels and risk of future cardiovascular events. And it turns out that the notion that lower LDL cholesterol is always better is not corroborated by recently published studies. And this was just another one of which, one of many studies that we've talked about as of late, uh, showing that there isn't this strong linear association with increased LDL cholesterol uh, in cardiovascular related events. In fact, lower than 100 milligrams per deciliter is not always protective. So that's it for today, friends. As always, I'm grateful that you tuned in all the way. Thank you for sharing this video with a friend who may benefit from this. I appreciate your comments, your likes. I will review some of your comments after the fact. And um, yeah, hopefully you got some value and check out the links in the show notes for the articles that we talked about today. We'll catch you on a future episode down the road.